What we want to do today is kind of shift gears, and uh, we're gonna, we've been talking about money and credit markets, and now what we want to do is start talking about banking. Uh, and we don't do that directly. We're not just going to say, oh, let's talk about banks. What we're going to do really is lead into this with the whole question of why do banks exist? And you know, we did that with um, this other issue of why does money exist? There are certain functions that money performs, certain functions that banks perform. And so before we get into talking about the details of banking itself, what assets do they hold and so forth, what we want to do is talk about this sort of a unique function performed by banks that if we didn't have bankers then we'd have this problem with our economy. And although it's kind of perhaps an unusual way of approaching it uh, for many people, economists have an entire discussion about this subject that's really kind of, I guess, generally described by the term asymmetric information. And what we're really going to get down to is the question of loans. That is really a key role played by banks in our economy is lending money. Right? If you want a car loan, you want a home loan, you want a personal loan, there's a very good chance you go to a bank, and if not a bank, some other institution that basically will perform these similar functions to what we're going to talk about here with respect to banking. And in this whole loan market, what we've got, you understand, with loans is we have, and we'll just describe this in very general terms, we have savers and we have borrowers. And the nature of a loan is that the saver provides dollars to the borrower and in return receives back, there's just some loan agreement, some document, and that's on day one. And then there's a point down the road where that loan is paid off, the money is given back, and the interest. But, here's the, so this is the nature of a loan, what happens on day one, and there's a problem with that, and the problem is, as I say, described by this term, asymmetric information. I guess eventually we'll look back on this discussion and we'll have an answer to this question. Hey, why don't we savers, I'm saving money for retirement, you're saving for whatever your purpose is, rainy day or retirement or something like that. Why don't I just lend my money to borrowers directly? Why don't I just go out and find somebody that wants to buy a car or buy a house and loan money to them? And the answer is, I don't do that because I want my money back. Here's the thing about lending money. Any idiot can lend money. All you have to do is get a bunch of money and sit down and put a sign up that says, I will loan money, and people will show up and take all your money. Now, even though any idiot can lend money, it takes some real skill to get it back. And so the reason that savers don't just go out and lend their own money out very often is they want it back and they don't know how to get it back. They don't know how to make the right loans and they don't know how to get that money back if there's a problem that's encountered down the road. And so what we do instead of savers handing their money over to borrowers, usually what happens is we savers hand our money over to somebody else like a bank. We make what is called a deposit in the bank and then the bank is the one that lends this money. And so there is this problem, or really a series of problems, that have this general heading of asymmetric information, and we'll talk more about it, but there's a series of problems that we as individuals would encounter and don't know how to deal with those problems of asymmetric information, whereas banks do. And so we hand our money, we savers, over to the banker or a credit union or a savings and loan and so forth. We hand our money over to one of these bankers and then the banker deals with asymmetric information. And so this is really going to be our justification for the role banks play in the financial system. So we want to talk about that today, maybe a little bit tomorrow. Okay. So anyway, what do we mean by asymmetric information? Just the term. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about the word information. And so what we have in mind here, and probably you know the word symmetry, 
Symmetry means the same on either side of something. Uh, a person's face is symmetrical if the right side looks just like the left side, except the mirror image of it. Uh, asymmetrical, the A means not. And so asymmetrical information means that information differs. And the information we're interested in is in this lending market or in financial markets. And what we would say is this, is that these two characters in our story, the borrower and the lender, they have different information. Okay, They simply don't possess the same information. And that being the case, it makes it difficult for these loan markets, financial markets, correctly speaking, I'm going to focus on loans. I'm taking a little bit of a detour here. I'm going to focus on loans, but really any issue of finance, sometimes what happens is companies will uh, finance their operations by selling stocks or shares. Sometimes they issue bonds, and this would be whether it's a company with a bond or a governmental unit. And then sometimes, whether it's a company or a governmental unit or a person, loans. These are always financial, or these are all financial types of operations. And so this asymmetric information problem, it exists every single time that we get involved in these financial transactions. Any form of finance, we encounter this. Our interest is loans because this is a class in money and banking. Banks basically are not investing in stocks. We've already talked about a little bit about the bonds, how that they rely on credit ratings and so forth from Moody's and Standard & Poor's. So our main focus here is loans, not only because we haven't talked about it before, but loans will be about 60% of total bank assets. Now that is a big number. I'm saying all the dollars coming into the bank from all sources, 60% of those dollars end up being loans. And so this is a big deal for banks. This is a main function of banks, more so than it is for any other financial institution. Okay, And since this is a big deal for banks, then we need to understand this whole specialization, this specialty that banks have. Why are they such good lenders? And the answer is they can come to terms with this problem of asymmetrical information. Now, let's put a little timeline up here. Here's uh, the loan is made, and here's the loan is paid off. And there are two different types of asymmetrical information that we're going to focus on. One occurs at the time a loan is made. What information do we have then at that moment? And what I'm saying to you again is that borrowers and lenders come together here, but borrowers know more about their situation. If you're borrowing money, let's say you're borrowing the money to buy a car, or to buy a house, or go on vacation, you know more about your situation than I do. I'm a lender, maybe I don't even know you, maybe we've never met before. And even if we're next door neighbors, as soon as you go home and shut the door, I don't know what's going on in your house. I don't know what's going through your head. I don't know what you're, uh, is happening down at work. I don't know what your plans are. And so the borrower has a real advantage about knowing about his or her own situation. And I'm talking about whether that borrower is a person or if it's maybe some corporate manager, small corporation, big corporation. The borrower's got the real advantage here. Okay. So there's one type of problem that occurs at that moment. When the loan is made, asymmetric information. The borrower knows more than the, the saver, the lender. And this makes it where the lender is reluctant to go ahead with the deal. Then after the loan is made, during this period, then there's another type of problem. We've got two different names for this. Here is adverse selection. Is the, nature, is the label given to the asymmetric information problems at the time the loan is made. And then there's another asymmetric information problem that occurs after the loan is made called moral hazard.
And we want to talk about these and not get too much into the lending, the financial markets aspect of it until we have a good understanding of what adverse selection means and moral hazard. Okay, but again, just to say it slightly differently, but the same idea. Adverse selection is a problem where there's unequal information, but at the time the loan is made. When we're negotiating, when we're signing the contract, we know different things. After the loan is made, now the money is handed over. Here you go, thank you very much. And now, what do you do if you're the borrower? What do you do, what information do you have and so forth that I don't have as the lender after the loan's made? And I'm still hoping to get paid back, okay? So anyway, uh, adverse selection. This term isn't used quite as much anymore, but used to be we would, I heard this term used a lot. I didn't even know what it meant the first time I heard it, probably in grade school sometime, about somebody buying a lemon, and they were talking about a lousy car. Okay, it's a car that's got problems, and once you own that car, you have problem after problem after problem, and it just never ends, and then you just say, how can I get away? And really, there's only one answer, and that would be like run it into a river, and call the police and say it's been stolen. Although we would never do that. No, but it's hard to get away from this. What do I do? Where do these lemons come from? Why do we have this problem? And the answer is asymmetric information. Let's say that you want to buy a car, a Toyota or a Honda or something like this. And you go online or you pick up the newspaper and you see here's a list. Honda Accords. And maybe you want to buy a um, 2005 model Honda Accord. And you look at it, and here's 15 of them. Huh, Honda Accord. Basically, there's a difference in color, and that's kind of it. How are you going to get the best one? Don't know. That's a problem, right? How are you going to avoid the one that's a problem down the road? Oh, I, I like this blue one. I buy the blue one. You know, and three months later, the transmission breaks, and two months later, the suspension breaks, and six months later the, after that, I need, you know, valve work done on the engine. And, and this just goes on and on, and what am I going to do? And the problem comes down to asymmetric information, because here's the deal. The man or woman who owns that car today, who's advertising it for sale, they know about that car, don't they? Like, they've been driving it. They've been having problems. And then they're going, oh, man, I've got to dump this thing. Now, there are other people who are driving Honda Accords, 2005 model, and they're in great shape. And they want to sell their cars, too. And they know it's a great car. But you're the buyer. And so you say, huh, here are all these Honda Accords. Which one should I buy? I don't know. And then you, what you do is we look. And there's some average price. Average price. And it doesn't make any difference what that average price is. I'm just going to say, I don't know, $15,000 just to set a number here, and we'll discuss that. But there's some average price for these cars. And that average price reflects the average quality, the average number of problems. It's X number of years old. It's got so many miles on it, and so forth. And so there's this sort of average price, and it reflects the average conditions of those cars of those 2005 model cars or whatever. And so that's what we see as the buyer. Huh, the average price, $15,000. Here's all these cars I can choose from. I wonder which is a good one. I wonder what's the bad one. I don't know. Suppose you're on the other side of the market. You've got a car for sale. It's a really great Honda Accord. You have had the oil changed every 2,000 miles. You have kept it in the garage every single night. You have never been speeding. You've never bumped into a curb. You are the perfect owner. And you want to sell your car, and you go, huh, the average Honda Accord, 2005 model, blah, 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 is selling for $15,000. I'm not going to let my car go for that. <coughs> this is outrageous. This is almost an insult. No way. So the people who have really nice cars, not a lemon, the opposite of a lemon, what would be the opposite of a lemon? A peach. A grapefruit. Hmm. What is the opposite of a lemon? 
a lime. Maybe, maybe a lime. Anyway, if you've got one of these really great cars, you just go, I'm not letting it go for that. So what happens is this. The people who have really great cars for sale, they just take them off the market, right? They just go, no, I'm not going to sell my car for this. Now, here's what you could do. Somebody comes out and they look at your car and they go, huh, 15,000 bucks is about what these are going for. And you go, no, 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 I want 22,000. I promise this is the greatest car in the world. Who believes that? I promise this is the greatest car in the world? Yeah, okay, thank you. But guess what? Everybody else with a Honda Accord 2005 model, they promise the same. Please take my car, it's worth 22,000. No. Because, I mean, you know, if that worked, then everybody would say, please take my car, it's worth 22,000, right? So the people with really nice Honda Accords, they don't have any way of, like, sending the brain waves. ESP, mind meld, what was that, that Spock guy does in Star Trek, you know, where you read your mind. We just don't have any way of doing this. So the person who's got a really nice Honda Accord just takes a car off the market. And maybe out of these 15 or 20 for sale, maybe five or six of them go off the market because they are just great cars. And now the ones that remain on the market, they're the same ones that were there before, but the best ones have been taken away, so average quality is really lower than before. So then people start going out and they start buying these things over time, you know, and then they go, oh my God. On average, these things aren't worth $15,000. On average, they're only worth $12,000 because of experience from all this. And the best ones are off the market and the people just keep on driving them, keep on driving them, keep on driving them. And the ones that are being traded, those are a little bit lower quality. And so over time with the experience and the word getting out and stuff like that, they go, you know, on average, these are only worth $12,000. And so we don't see this price persist, it goes down. Here's $12,000. And then somebody who's got maybe a little bit imperfect Honda Accord that is worth $15,000, they just go, I'm not selling my car for the average price. Now the average price is 12. I'm going to take this car off the market. I'm going to keep driving it because I can only get 12 for it and it's worth 15. I just keep driving it. And so the ones that are worth $15,000, those are taken from the market and the owners continue driving them. And the only ones that remain are really bad Honda Accords, the lemons. And so then, after the word gets out, boy, those Honda Accords are not very good. The one out there on the used car market, the price goes down to $10,000. And there, there's somebody that's got one that's truly worth 12,000 bucks, but then they say, I'm not selling my car for $10,000. It's worth 12. They keep it. And the only Honda Accords out there that are for sale are worth $10,000 or less. But once the word gets out, boy, did you buy one of those Honda Accords? Those things, the wheels are falling off of it. The price goes down. And what's happening is this, is that if there's a price, and it doesn't make any difference which one of these prices we start off, if there's a price, the only people who will sell for that price are the ones who have a below average quality car. And anybody who's got a car that's above average quality, they say, I'm not letting my car go for $15,000. And what's the cause of this? And the cause of it is asymmetric information. We can't look at that car and say, this is a good one, that's a bad one. We can't read the minds of the owners. The owners know if they've got a problem car or a really great car, but we buyers don't know that. And that being the case, the average price is going to reflect the average experience of people who buy these. And then over time, the ones with the above average cars just won't sell them for that. And the, the average quality goes down and the price keeps going down. Now, what do we do about this? What we do about it is we try and get rid of this asymmetric information problem. But if we don't do anything about it, we just say a bunch of people go out there and buy cars and whatever the experience is, they tell their neighbors and tell their friends and whatever, but that's it. Then what happens is finally this used car market goes away. Because nobody will sell an above average quality car for an average price. And uh, so what happens is the good cars are withdrawn, the remaining cars are of lower quality, and then the average price goes down, and more of the above average cars are withdrawn, and finally nobody participates in the market. This market falls apart.
Why? Asymmetric information. What do we do about it? One thing we do is this. We ask for these Carfax reports. Give me a report on this particular car. Here's the VIN number. I want to know if this car has been in a fire, a flood, a wreck. I want to know if it's had major repairs. I want to know how many owners it's had in the past. Has this changed hands over and over and over? Okay. Another thing we do, sometimes we say, I want to test drive the car, and then we go down the street, and we've got maybe some trusted mechanic, and this, we say, hey, would you look this car over and tell me if you see any problems with it? I mean, we're trying to come to terms with these problems because otherwise we're not going to be able to buy a good car. Okay. So sometimes what happens is we say, I'm not going to buy a used car whether it's a Honda or anything else, I'm not going to buy a used car from a person. I'm only going to buy one if I can get it from a dealer, and that dealer will give me a warranty. And so that way, if in the first 90 days or whatever the warranty would cover, if during that period I have any significant problems, I can go back to that dealer, and they will fix the problem. But without these other steps, the Carfax or the have a, you know, a mechanic look at it or get a warranty or something like that, without that, this used car market will disappear. And it's because of asymmetric information. Sellers know more about their cars than buyers do. Let's talk about moral hazard. By the way, I'll bring this, come back and relate this lemons problem, this adverse selection. By the way, what do we mean by this adverse selection? We are selecting through this process of not having enough information. We are selecting out only the worst cars that will trade in the marketplace. An adverse is negative, so we're selecting the worst cars, and we end up with a market dominated by lemons, unless we take some corrective steps. Okay. So anyway, let's talk about moral hazard. And. I'll come back. I was talking about cars here a moment ago. I'll talk about cars again. Let's say car insurance. This term moral hazard was developed in the insurance industry a long time ago. And basically, what this is about, what the insurance industry had to come to terms with is this, is they said, you know, once we insure something for people, like their cars, some people act kind of irresponsibly. Because like if you have no insurance and you're driving down a road and you run your car into a curb or into a post or something like that, then one of two things happens. One of three things happens. One is you run it into something and now it won't drive anymore and you are afoot. And the second thing that happens is you run it into something and now you've got to get it paid or you got to get it paid. you got to get it fixed, and you pay for that out of your pocket. And that hurts you. So in the first case, you were afoot. And in the second case, you are spending a lot of money out of your own pocket. Right? And so there's just no way of avoiding the responsibility for being a lousy driver if you have no insurance. But if you do have insurance, and you're driving down the road, and maybe text messaging, Sound familiar? Or on the cell phone, or swatting the kids in the back seat, acting like you're swatting them. Or speeding a little bit. Maybe you're not speeding going fast like 80 miles an hour. Maybe what you're doing is driving 50 miles an hour on snow and ice, but that's kind of speeding. You start acting a little bit irresponsible, and you bump into something a post or a curb or another car. And you get out of your car and look the situation over and say, that's too bad. And then you get out your phone and you call the insurance agent, right? Have the car towed in, have it fixed, and send the bill to the insurance agent. And so now the insurance agent, not just the agent, but the company, is going, Oh my gosh. You know, here's this person that would be totally responsible if they had to pay the bill out of their own pocket. And now that we're paying the bill for them, they're text messaging, they're making phone calls, they're driving too fast, they're driving recklessly, having conversations. This is terrible. We just can't afford to insure these people. 
And there's a whole raft of things like, and we hear about some of this with health insurance. Oh, we've got somebody else to pay our bills. So, if you break a fingernail, maybe you can go to the doctor and see, you know, have them look that over. I've exaggerated, but that's the idea. Ask for a pill for every little thing that goes wrong. Don't exercise. Don't stop smoking. If you get sick, somebody else will pay the bill. Or, oh, I love candles. I'll burn candles throughout my house. Well, what if one of those candles kind of gets a little bit too close to a curtain or to the wall or something like that before you know what the house burns out? What do I do? Do I just go, oh, I just lost $150,000 there. Boy, I was stupid. That'll take me years to make up for that. Do, is that what we do? Or do we go, oh, I'll just live outside on the ground? No. What we say is, well, shucks, that fire got out of control. We call the insurance agent and say, hey, I need to get my house rebuilt. I'll send you the bill. We behave more recklessly after somebody else is paying the bill. And that's what moral hazard is about. That's what insurance companies are, how they describe it, is the moral hazard problem is once you take over responsibility for somebody else, then that somebody else has new incentives, and the incentive is to behave more recklessly, to behave less responsibly. You with me on this deal? Now, what do car com uh, insurance companies do? A car insurance company will say something like this, oh, you had a fender bender, we're going to raise your premiums. Or they may say, oh, you had a fender bender, you're canceled. What they are trying to do is protect themselves against this irresponsible behavior by, again, putting some of the consequences back on you from behaving irresponsibly. Right? And they may say something like this, if you get a certain number of tickets, speeding tickets, then we will raise your premium or cancel you. Or if you get a DWI, we will raise your premium or cancel you. So what they're trying to do is place a penalty on you so that you don't engage in these irresponsible actions. Same kind of deal. Now, so we've got asymmetric information. Here's where it comes into play. After somebody gives you insurance, then at that point, you're covered and you can kind of do what you want and somebody else pays the bill. And now we have to have a solution for that, otherwise nobody would issue insurance, right? If, if you could just go out and let's say do DWIs and speed and have wrecks and your premium is, I don't know, $500 every six months no matter what. Who would have that insurance? You would? Yeah. You crazy maniac. Okay, but the point is, we'd all say, yeah, give me that insurance. I'll just do whatever I want to do. I'm going to light a bonfire right in the middle of my living room. I'm never going to exercise. Smoke, smoke, smoke. Whatever goes wrong, somebody else will pay the bill. Demand the best. I need a new heart. Just put it in. New lungs. I mean, whatever you can do, fix it up. I want something nice. Give me a handsome face. No, there's no insurance for that. Anyway, so we have this problem. Insurance companies then try to protect themselves against this moral hazard problem. What about financial markets? In the financial markets, we want to come back to these two problems, adverse selection and moral hazard. And by the way, let me go back. For the most part, large companies, when they need financing, large companies issue stocks and bonds to get that financing. For the most part, large companies don't get loans. People cannot issue stocks and bonds, except in rare cases. People, when they need money, get loans. And so I'm mainly now going to be talking about, since it's loans that concern banks, we're mainly talking about smaller companies and mainly talking about people. So anyway, let's say you're running a bank and you say, I've got money to lend. Quite a bit. I've got several million dollars to lend. 
And then you just have a whole bunch of people lined up to take out loans. And we don't know one from another, right? These are just people. And they're just lined up saying, I want $10,000, $20,000, $50,000. What interest rate do we charge them? And the answer is, I don't know, these are people, they're borrowing money for houses, I'll charge them, I don't know, 7%, or just set some average rate, which reflects average risk. And there are some people that say to themselves, gosh, I am a really good borrower. I have a great job. I've had it for years. I've been getting raises. I've never been laid off. I'm totally responsible with my spending. I've got assets, I've got maybe, uh, you know, a couple of houses, rental houses or some other assets that if I didn't make payments on this loan, the banker could come and take those away from me. And that banker wants to charge me 7%. And maybe this is the really good borrower, and he or she knows this. I'm a really good borrower. I promise I'll pay you. Word of honor. And there's somebody else over here, and maybe what happens is they go through periods of unemployment and they don't have their expenditures under control. And maybe what's happened is they're not always good about paying their payments on time, utility bills, car payments, and things like that. But if there's just this asymmetric information and we don't know anymore, and that's where we're starting this process off is the asymmetric information. Each person knows about themselves, but the lender doesn't know. And for sure, if you were the, the lender, you wouldn't know these things about people. They just come up to you and say, I want to borrow money. So here's this average rate, 7%. And this guy goes, I'm insulted. There's no way I'm going to pay 7%. You're charging everybody 7%. There's no risk in lending me the money. And so people who are a really good credit risk, they just say, I'm not interested. And then the people who are really kind of deadbeats, they go, 7% is reasonable. I would pay that. We just promised to pay it. And so what happens is, this is like the good cars are taken off the market. The good borrowers remove themselves from the market. And all that remains are the not so good borrowers. And so bankers would go ahead and say, oh, we'll make these loans. And they make a series of them. And they go, you know, defaults are higher than we expected. I don't think 7 percent is right anymore. Let's charge 8 percent. There's a higher default rate than we expected. So they charge 8 percent. And there's somebody else that goes, well, you know, I'm a pretty good borrower. Now, I'm not perfect. I've been unemployed a couple times in the last five years. My kids are in college. It's costing me quite a bit of money to put them through school. And, you know, there's a chance that I'd have trouble making these payments, but I sure think I could. I'm really committed to it. And this guy goes, 8%, that's too much. So he goes, ah, I just don't think I'm interested. And this guy goes, I'll take that, I'll pay 8%. And because this guy knows, uh, yeah, I'll promise to pay 8% if I can, and I will. But if I can't, I'll run and hide. This person knows about his situation. There's asymmetric information. There's no look on the face. You can't say, that person's handsome. They're going to make their payments on time. This person's not handsome. They won't. That's not how we do it. This person's got facial hair. This one doesn't. This one's tall. This one's short. No, that doesn't do it. Big muscles, small muscles. How do we tell? And if we go back, we as individuals, before the banks entered the scene, and what I'm really going to tell you is banks are the specialists at dealing with this, but before banks entered the scene, it was just people making loans that was hard for people to know. And so what happened over time is the good borrowers said, I'm not willing to pay that average rate. And they went away. And the ones that remained were the lemons, the bad borrowers. And we had high default rates. And over time, what's happening is this market's going away. The people who are the savers, you or I, that are saving for retirement and we're lending money, 
over time we just go, man, this is a losing proposition. I loan my money out and I don't get it back. And if I'm not careful, there will be no money for retirement. No. And guess what? When people start doing that and say, nah, there will be no money for retirement if I keep lending, then at that point there are no loans. And by the way, a similar problem exists in these other markets. We're just not talking about them, but the stock market and the bond market, it is, I don't want to participate. And as soon as we savers just start pulling back saying, I don't want to participate, there aren't loans. And then what happens is, huh, all these activities that cause our economy to be strong, those activities don't get undertaken. There aren't people buying houses. There aren't people starting companies. And it's because, and I just was given the example of an individual, but it's the same thing for companies. Small companies also, there are different small companies. Some of them are really likely to pay off their loans, and some of them are really not likely. And the ones, and if we just set some rate on average, this is about average for default risk among small companies, then the ones that are the very best companies just say, I'm not paying that rate. They pull themselves out of the market, and only the lemons remain. And then after a while, there's no savers that want to extend money to them. So it's the lemon problem all over again. The financial market, here the used car market was falling apart in the lemon market, and here we've got the financial market falling apart. Let's go back to moral hazard. Suppose that I loan you money, and you say to me, oh, I'm going to start a company, or oh, I'm going to use this money to go to school, take some classes, become an accountant or whatever, and then I'll have these skills, and my income will go up, and I can easily pay you off. And I say, oh, okay, you know, you've made a good case. Here, I'm going to lend you, I don't know, 50000 bucks. You go to school. You become an accountant. You earn an extra $20,000 a year. You pay me off in a few years. I'll get my money back, and you'll be in a better position. You say, okay, so I give you your $50,000. You go to school, and you train to be, I don't know, an artist, a sociologist, whatever you feel like. Moral hazard is, after the transaction occurs, then the hazard is, from my point of view, the lender's point of view, that you may be doing something at that point irresponsible with my money. And I don't mean to say it's irresponsible to become an artist or irresponsible to become a sociology major. I mean, I gave you my money because I thought, hey, here's this activity that's going to be financed with my money, and that activity will generate enough revenue to pay me off. And then what you may do, I lend you the money and maybe you go on vacation and say, oh, I'm going to you know, take spring break that goes from this spring until next spring. A one-year spring break. What a spring break. And then you come back and you go, I'm sorry, you know, I'm just not going to be able to pay that loan off. So moral hazard is the problem that once somebody else is basically your financial backer, that you'll do something with that, irresponsible, and make it impossible for them to collect their money. And so, if I'm saving for retirement, and you come to me and say, oh, I want to borrow some money, I don't know, I may be dumb enough to do this a time or two with people, but after a while I go, you know, I loan that money to people, and as soon as I do, they just go do something irresponsible. And by the way, let me just say as an aside, I have, over the years, had friends who borrow money from me, and it's never paid back like it's promised. Now, that's... It's not an overgeneralization for my case. I'm not going to tell you that everybody in the world goes out and make loans to friends and you'll never get it back. Maybe you will. I don't. Friends, relatives, and I don't lend to strangers. But I'm just saying to you that if you want to retire someday and you're saving money and people still come and borrow money from you, it's going to be hard to make a choice of to who to lend it to in the first place. And if you say, boy, I think I got this one right, it's hard at that point to make sure that they do something responsible with that money. And so what do we do? We just say, no, I'm not going to make that loan. And when we say, no, I'm going to not make that loan, then what happens is there aren't loans, and then there aren't people going to college, there aren't people starting businesses. Those things that are essential for the functioning of our economy, that falls apart. The credit markets go away. And so what I'm saying to you is this process of us just trying to deal with adverse selection and moral hazard on our own, it doesn't work very well. We have that choice. 
There is nobody in the world that says you may not loan your savings directly to people. There's not a law that says you can't do it. And yet, when we go out there in the world and look around, what we find out is people do not lend their savings out directly to other people and small companies as a rule. Rarely they do it, but as a rule, they don't. Now, why not? And the answer is these problems are something they cannot come to terms with. They cannot solve it on their own. And so what we do is we say, we've got to find a solution to these problems, and the solution we find is banks. Banks have found a way to come to terms with adverse selection and moral hazard problems. And we'll talk about that a little bit next time. So long.